this morning, then a chance of continued rain this afternoon and a high near 41 degrees today. Tonight, mostly cloudy with lows near freezing or 32 degrees. And on Tuesday, sunny with highs reaching back up into the low 50s. Right now, it's 31 degrees in Charlotte. This is WFAE News. More news at WFAE.org. This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. Unconstitutional. That's what the North Carolina Supreme Court declared the new congressional and legislative maps to be last Friday evening. Drawn by the Republican-controlled legislature, these new maps, based on the 2020 census, would give a Republican candidate a sizable advantage in a state that is nearly evenly split between Democrats and Republicans. Overturning a lower court decision, the state Supreme Court ruled the maps were skewed so far to the right that they are unconstitutional beyond a reasonable doubt and ordered them to be redrawn in a way that will give voters of all political parties substantially equal opportunity to translate votes into seats. We've been here before with previous maps drawn by the legislature and thrown out by the courts, but this time the clock is ticking and time is about to run out. The court mandated new maps be filed by February 18th. That's 11 days away. And this hour, we examine the court's decision, what it will mean for our politics, our elections and our democracy and what it may mean for other parts of the country. We're joined by Steve Harrison, WFAE's political reporter. Good morning, Steve. Hey, good morning, Mike. Seema Iyer is with us. She's the chief legal correspondent for WJZY 46 Queen City News. Good morning to you. Good morning, everyone. And Dr. Michael Bitzer joins us. He's the chair of the Department of Political Science and professor of politics and history at Catawba College. Michael, welcome back. Good to see you. Good to be with you. Steve, this decision overturned, as I said, a lower court ruling, which allowed the maps to stand. That court had a Republican majority. The state Supreme Court has a Democratic majority, and the vote split along party lines, four to three. So should we see this as a political decision or as a fairly decided, a one that's fairly decided on the merits of the case and on what the state constitution says? Um, I think it's impossible to kind of pull politics out of this and say that it wasn't part of the decision. I mean, that's just, I think, difficult in any circumstance, and especially in 2022. Um, I think that the ruling from the state Supreme Court, based on the politics like you talked about, and based on the line of questioning from the hearing earlier in the week, it wasn't a surprise. I think a lot of people expected the maps to be overturned in kind of the more interesting thing or what we didn't know was what the remedy would be, what was going to happen next. And um, for Republicans, the good news is they get a second opportunity to draw these maps and, and then that the, that the court did not impose their own maps or appoint a special master to do it. So they get kind of another bite at the apple. Steve, racial gerrymandering has been declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court. Uh, partisan gerrymanders have not, at least not on the national level. And in 2019, the high court ruled that the constitutionality of partisan gerrymanders should be left to the states uh, and to the dictates of the various states' constitutions. In our state, Supreme Court's view, at least, what does the Constitution say about partisan gerrymanders? Uh, Seema. Well, the Constitution says that uh, partisan gerrymandering is basically allowed, but it can't be to that extreme level. And that was what was being decided here. And funny enough, the United States Supreme Court from 2019, that case that you just mentioned, is from where? North Carolina, involving one of the actually the same plaintiffs, common cause. So basically, the federal government in that case, the United States Supreme Court said, we're going to leave it up to the states, which is why this Supreme Court very much relied on that ruling. The lower court said that this was non judiciable uh, if that's the way you say it, because of Justiciable. the separation. <laughs> okay, because of separation of powers. Uh, how, did, uh, how did the state Supreme Court decide that it was in fact able to take up this case and not relegate it back to the legislature? 
Well, this is really interesting. It was actually the first uh, paragraph or two of the order. And the Supreme Court basically said, listen, it is our duty to uphold the constitutional rights of our citizens. It's the General Assembly's duty to reapportion North Carolina's uh, legislative districts. However, this is the big but, those duties by the General Assembly are subjected to constitutional uh, barriers and basically saying your power, the state's power, can't override any individual's constitutional rights. And that is what's happening. So basically, General Assembly, you are on our turf now and we have to step in. And specifically, the Supreme Court of North Carolina is referring to Article One of our Declaration of Rights. And in Article One, we have the Free Elections Clause the free speech clause, equal protection, and freedom of assembly. And also final note that free elections clause is something that not is something particular to the state that other states as well have. Michael Bitzer, you and I cannot count on our fingers and toes collectively the number of times that we have talked about redrawing maps in North Carolina. Uh, we're running out. Uh, the, the overturning, it, it, it's becoming a, a habit, I suppose. Last time, one judge pointed out that the maps drawn by the legislature had been drawn with surgical precision to eliminate, uh, dis to disenfranchise certain voters. This time, the justices ruled that the maps were skewed so far to the right that they violated, quote, the free elections clause that Decima just spoke about, the equal protection clause, the free speech clause, and the freedom of assembly clause of our state constitution. Did GOP lawmakers not see this coming? I, I think certainly they did, but the issue that they would have is, as you noted before, the justiciability of this particular case, that there is a doctrine known as political questions that when the courts are confronted with issues that are so partisan, that are so political, as Steve said, and as scholars have acknowledged, redistricting is the most political activity in American politics, that the courts should defer to the political branches and ultimately to the will of the voters to have their say in their power. But this court decided, as Seema noted, that the Constitution and the interpretation of the Constitution is judicial power. It is the domain of the courts. And that's where you have the controversy in a four to three split vote. Well, plus the way these maps were drawn, could it not be argued that the will of the voters would never have come through because they were being shut out of the process? That, that is part of the argument that the challengers would have made. I think basically succinctly that the legislators were picking the voters and not the voters picking the legislators. When this case, Steve, was argued in front of the three-judge court, uh, the plaintiffs charged that, like previous maps drawn by Republican-controlled legislatures, these new maps were gerrymandered in ways that disenfranchise and weaken the power of Black and minority voters and make it difficult for Democrats to win. This high court decision seemed to center on the latter argument. Would that be accurate? And if so, what about that other suit uh, that was regarding the racial gerrymandering aspect of these maps? Yeah, I, you're right that the that the focus on the state supreme court was on um, was on the overall partisan fairness and the partisan makeup of the maps. Um, the the racial ger prohibit prohibition on racial ger racial gerrymandering is a federal issue, um, and so this was all about the numbers, the number of competitive seats, the number of seats that lean toward the Republican as Republicans as opposed to the Democrats. Um, so that was really, really the crux of the issue. And now the next phase to try and figure out uh, what is the most fair map and what map will, will, will the court approve. So there were these two seats. One was about black voters. One was about uh, uh, the political gerrymandering aspect of these maps as drawn. If racial gerrymandering has also been already been deemed at odds with the United States Constitution, why did the lower court 
What did they have to say about the racial gerrymandering allegations? Um, how could they have written that, quote, despite our disdain for having to deal with issues that potentially lead to results incompatible with democratic principles, these maps are the result of a democratic process? Seema, how could the lower court have found that? I personally just didn't understand uh, why the lower court and, and frankly, uh, the Supreme Court didn't spend enough time talking about that connection between racial gerrymandering and partisan gerrymandering. However, I think it was Judge Irvin and he questioned uh, one of the plaintiff's lawyers and he had said to her, isn't partisan gerrymandering just a proxy for racial gerrymandering and then she was like oh yes that's it and uh and then she i think it was allison riggs uh the the plaintiff's lawyer who who was having this um, back and forth with the judge and then finally we seem to get to this connection between in north carolina it is well known who black voters vote for. It is well entrenched in our environment. So therefore, when you say racial gerrymandering, you are also saying partisan gerrymandering. But overall, in my opinion, the connection wasn't made clear enough. No, in the lower court. Yeah, the, the, oh, oh, sorry. Go you go ahead, ahead, Michael. Steve. Well, I was just going to say, and the state Supreme Court in its order did say to the legislature, you have to do what is called racially polarized analysis racially polarized right. voting analysis. So we may get some sense of that. But again, as you noted earlier, we're talking about an extremely tight deadline and how the legislature is going to respond to this is you know, still up in the air at this point. Steve, did you want to chime in on that? Oh, I was just going to say that the lower court in that decision in January, kind of going back to what Seema said, I mean, it was a bit of a circular argument where they said, um, just because almost all Demo almost all African Americans in North Carolina vote for Democrats, uh, they just came down on this on the argument that well, that may be, but uh, they are being targeted as Democrats, not as Black voters. Now, again, as we talk, you can you can kind of keep playing this out over and over again. And the trial court, you know, kind of they ruled that it, it was kind of an issue of happenstance rather than rightly or wrongly, rather than uh, a direct targeting. The maps, uh, Michael, that were overturned last Friday afternoon by the state Supreme Court gave Republicans a significant advantage in both the legislative and congressional uh, races. I think it gave GOP candidates an advantage of 10 of the state's 14 congressional seats, and in the good year, they might be able to take 11. Democrats countered that in presidential contests, Democratic candidates get 47 to 48 percent of the vote, and that would make this a purple state. Further evidence that these maps were unfairly drawn. Uh, are we a purple state, or is this just pure muscle flexing? No, we, we are a purple state. We're a 5149 state. I argue that we are a purple state with a very light red tint to it. But <laughs> as we saw in 2020, Donald Trump can win this state. So too can Roy Cooper, a Democrat. But the bases are so polarized in this state that we're seeing this kind of dynamic play out and the electoral system is already skewed. If you win one seat, you win 100% of that seat. We don't have proportionality in terms of representation. Uh, uh, when the legislature set out to draw these latest maps, Steve, they did so using a new promise, a, a process which they promised would be transparent. Uh, they did their work in full view. Ordinary citizens could watch them on the internet as they went through this map drawing process. And later, we discovered that one of the Republicans working on the map, State Representative Destin Hall, regularly left the room, we discovered now, to secretly consult these secretly drawn maps. And he admitted to that on the stand in the lower court trial in direct contradictions to what Republicans told Democrats as the process was unfolding. And then when asked to produce those clandestine maps, the uh, the plaintiffs in the case, I think we're told that they no longer existed. When we come back, I want to find out what, if any, role that played in the high court's decision that you essentially have uh, just destroyed evidence uh, to the to the in the case. We'll come right back with more in a moment. Charlotte talks. 
Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Tryon Medical Partners, an independent practice with physicians in 10 specialty areas providing care at locations across the Charlotte region. Tryon Medical Partners, more at tryonmed.com. A new year, a new report. This time, one detailing plans to combat homelessness in Charlotte. 3,000 people were experiencing homelessness last summer. 10,000 more were at risk of the eviction. It's been a problem here for years, despite well-intentioned efforts to get a handle on it, including significant monetary contributions from the public and private sectors and a series of bonds to make affordable housing more plentiful. We look at what this new report suggests in terms of long-term solutions for homelessness tomorrow on this program at nine. You've already seen the headlines, the alerts lighting up your phone all day. For a deeper dive into what it means, there's All Things Considered from NPR News. Listen every afternoon. I'm Gwendolyn Glenn. Join me for WFAE's All Things Considered weekdays from 4 to 6.30 on 90.7 WFAE and at WFAE.org. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about the state Supreme Court decision on, on Friday afternoon, late Friday afternoon, to overturn the latest set of voter maps drawn by the GOP-controlled legislature. They now have until February 18th to get new maps to the courts to decide whether those maps can stand. Steve Harrison is joining us. He's WFAE's political reporter. Seema Iyer is chief legal correspondent for WJZY 46 Queen City News. And Dr. Michael Bitzer is chair of the Department of Politics and History at Catawba College. So getting back to the trial, the lower court trial, uh, Steve, where uh, it was admitted by one of the chief Republican map drawers that he consulted secret maps and that those maps were no longer available to see. What, if any, uh, role did that play in the higher court's decision on, over the weekend? So the, the, the Supreme Court will issue its full ruling. I mean, uh, uh, this was the kind of a 20-page uh, summary, so to speak. So they, it, this may be addressed in the full ruling to come out later, but in, in what was put out on Friday, it didn't wasn't mentioned at all. I mean, I, I don't think so. I don't remember seeing it. And, you know, so the, the kind of reading into that, it seems the idea was that the Destin Hall testimony about the secret maps in a way was, was definitely an embarrassment for the Republican Party because it went against these pledges they'd made for this no racial data, no political data, all this transparency. Um, but the Supreme Court didn't seem to really consider that a big deal. It, 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 there, it, my reading was, it seems to be, it doesn't matter what process you use, let's just look at the end result. And they felt that the end result was really unfair and violated the state constitution. Emma, what about precedent? Uh, we, the fact that political gerrymandering and, and racial gerrymandering seems to be a habit with uh, our GOP map drawers in North Carolina going back several cases. Did that play a role? Not as much as I thought, because what when it terms to, of precedent, what was really focused on is this non-justiciability precedent, especially with the legislative defendants, because they're saying, hey, you can't legislate and you've never done this before. There's no legal standard for this court to uh, order new maps. And the judges were saying, well, wait, we have this power because it's the Constitution and that gives us the power. So it's like Judge Justice Morgan was really focusing on this Constitution argument, whereas the defendant's attorney was saying, no, that's not what you're doing. What you're doing is you're trying to create a new standard and now you are crossing the line into policy making. So by asking us, asking the General Assembly to redraw these maps, you, you're violating this whole separation of powers. Uh, so that to me was the major focus. And then, and I'm not sure which justice, but one of the justices came back with him, it came back to uh, the, I think it's Phil Stratch is his name. Um, yeah, so they came back to him and said, wait a minute, you're telling us that we're never allowed to 
be the first to create a legal standard. And then he pushed back. He said, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you can't make policy. And just one more point to counter that argument is that later on, or I'm sorry, in the order, it specifically says to comply with this ruling, they're asking the General Assembly to harken back to traditional neutral redistricting criteria. So in a way, I think that gives the court out, like they're not trying to create new policy, they're just saying, go to the traditional um, parameters. Michael, we've been watching a Republican controlled legislatures around the country uh, for the last several years in their naked attempts to draw voter lines in ways that marginalize voters who are least likely to vote for them. And those attempts to allow politicians to choose, as you mentioned a second ago, to choose their voters as opposed to voters choosing their elected officials have been ramped up in the aftermath of the big lie uh, being told by the ex-president and his uh, cohorts to the point where a lot of pundits see us on the precipice of losing our democracy. Does this decision act as a kind of stop sign or speed bump in slowing down that process? I think certainly in North Carolina, it does. Uh, it will be interesting to see how the legislature responds to the court's order and what kind of approach they take to prove or to show that they had no partisan intent in redrawing these next sets of maps, which I presume that they will do. But I, I also have to acknowledge that this is probably one of the last truly bipartisan activities in American politics nowadays. If you look at states like New York, if you look at states like Illinois, they have the Democrats are in control of those general assemblies and they have gone after Republicans in terms of their gerrymandering based on partisanship in those states as well. So basically the gloves have come off in a lot of states, both Republicans and Democrats are trying to you know, achieve goals all in order to try and achieve control over the US House of Representatives and their general assemblies and legislators. And Steve, uh, North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein was among the first to talk about this on Friday when this decision came down. He wrote under our, I think he tweeted, under our constitution, political power must be vested in and derived from the people and our government must be founded upon their will only. Our elected officials uh, flout that principle when they seek to perpetuate their power irrespective of the will of the voters. But when Democrats were in charge, didn't they do the same thing? They did, and those were in the days when, um, if you look at the maps, you know, from from uh, from when the Democrats were in charge. I mean, they were, uh, you know, these crazy squiggly lines that you know the the old district that went all the way up Interstate 85 from Charlotte to Greensboro. Um, you know, the Republicans like to point out that that the Democrats did it, and just to to pivot off what Michael just said. Um, people tracking redistricting nationwide with all the different states, it's not over yet. But right now, Democrats are on track. They're ahead a little bit from where they were in 2020. They are on pace to pick up or not pick up, but have the advantage in two or three more seats than they did in the 2020 election because of this two-pronged strategy. Like Michael said, in the districts that in the, in the states where they're controlling redistricting, they are being brutal, just like Republicans are. And at the same time, they have this very effective legal strategy to sue and, and try and fight back on Republican maps in places like Pennsylvania, North Carolina. So um, it is a, the Democrats are no longer disarming themselves this cycle. They are getting after it. Eva. Yeah, you had asked about uh, precedent and Steve just mentioned Pennsylvania. So that was one case. And that was a case out of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court from 2018. Uh, League of Women Voters was the plaintiffs. And so that case was mentioned a lot. And after it was decided that basically uh, because of the free elections clause and the similar constitution clauses, uh, re redrawing of maps was ordered. Uh, uh, that when that was decided, Pennsylvania was saying, okay, now we are uh, going to change everything. And they are in fact right, because the North Carolina Supreme Court didn't have a lot to look to, to lean on, but it did lean on this. And it really shows the power of, you know, that kind of 
horizontal precedent. So, so Michael, with both sides doing this, where they have the ability to do it, we have one side being accused of trying to end our democracy by eliminating uh, and anybody who doesn't vote for them, and that would be the Republican side. But the Democrats are doing this. In those states where the Democrats are doing this, are they being accused of ending our democracy or attempting to do so? I, I think you will start to hear that that refrain uttered about, you know, certainly by Republicans against people, uh, legislators in New York and Illinois well, as prime examples. Well, let me ask this then to you. Uh, are, are both sides doing that? Is, is this a blatant attempt to simply take the world and, and make it your oyster and lock the voters out on both sides? So in the introduction to my book on this very topic, redistricting yes. and gerrymandering in North Carolina, I start off by saying redistricting is the most political activity in American politics, period. And we see it playing itself out yet again over the past 70 years since the redistricting revolution that the U.S. Supreme Court instituted, states are taking this and saying, how can we utilize our political power over time to ensure that we stay in political power? It's a bipartisan effort. It's a bipartisan activity, and it is going to the extremes as we are seeing in a polarized environment. But in many of those same Republican controlled states, we are also seeing Republican uh, lawmakers and governors and people like that try to put into place people in the elections machinery who will vote, who will uh, manipulate the vote, uh, that they're, they're being accused of that, so that the Republican candidate for whatever office wins and, and seem to be willing to overturn the will of the people. Is that same thing happening to any great degree in democratically controlled states? I, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not that familiar with that particular dynamic. I think what, what that is equating is the election administration right. with the designing of electoral districts. And I think that those two are connected, but they are very separate in this instance. We do have Republicans seeking positions like secretaries of state who oversee election administrations in the states. And they are saying some of them are campaigning on the 2020 big lie that the former president has perpetuated. Seymour, Republicans wanted uh, Democratic uh, Justice Anita Earls to recuse herself from the Supreme Court case because she received a $250,000 campaign contribution from the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, a group that helped fund one of these lawsuits. Democrats wanted Republican Justice Phil Berger to recuse himself because his father is the state Senate Republican leader. Should this have happened? Should the both of them have recused themselves? Or does the fact that neither recused themselves, do their votes simply cancel each other out? You know, that's a good argument, Mike, but for the fact that there was also a motion for Justice Irvin to recuse himself because he's up for re-election. Steve probably knows this. He's up for re-election. So he's got a, what's a, a dog in vested the interest. race or something. <laughs> yeah, vested interest. That's the word. Okay. So here's the the big picture of, of recusal. It is nearly impossible. Okay. I just before this trial happened, I happened to do uh, a some legal research on recusal. It is a really impossible standard. Let me give you an example. So let's say uh, one of the justices had a financial interest in one of the parties while the trial was going on. That may be a reason for recusal. Like you have directly at that moment could benefit uh, or be hindered by what happens at that proceeding. That's one example. Another example is, uh, you know, if two people are, even if two people were involved in a romantic relationship, I don't even think that could rise to the level because there is that really close connection between the burgers, father and son. And Justice Earls, uh, not only did she receive those contributions, but there is a YouTube video of her uh, giving some kind of speech on uh, gerrymandering and you know the the uh, you know how terrible it is, et cetera, et cetera. But still, none of those rise to the level of recusal. Also, so so number one, it would be uh, an almost admittance that you can't be impartial, right? So if the chief justice was like, okay, I'm gonna 
kick you guys off, even if they just did the two of them, right? So it was Berger and Earls. And they and then it's it's almost for their future and for their legacy, it looks like they cannot, in fact, be impartial. But uh, the bottom line is there was no direct connection between the trial, the proceeding that was in front of them, and their uh, history of involvement. And because the bar for recusal is so, it, it's really quite impossible, I was not surprised that nobody was recused. Dr. Michael Vitzer, Republicans in the legislature and in, in the state Republican Party have described this decision as highly partisan because of the 4-3 party line vote, all Republicans voting against, all Democrats voting for. Uh, some have characterized it as one branch of the government overstepping its bounds into legislative territory. But in its ruling, the court states, quote, it is the state judiciary that has the responsibility to protect the state constitutional rights of the citizens, and they point to the rights guaranteed by the Declaration of Rights in Article I of the state constitution and to the Free Elections Clause and call these, quote, individual and personal rights entitled to protection against state action, which is the duty of the court to protect. Isn't that how it's supposed to work? Isn't that correct? If you believe in the judicial power and the ultimate idea of judicial review, which is interpretation of the law and how that relates to individual liberties versus the powers of the branches of government, yes, we've had this political battle between the legislature and the courts in previous redistricting uh, activities. I point back to 2002 when the shoes were on the other feet. We had a Democratic legislature. We had a Republican state Supreme Court. The Republican state Supreme Court under then uh, uh, Chief Justice issued the Stevenson case, which was basically defining and putting into policy the whole county provision. And the Democrats in the legislature went apoplectic much like what the Republicans are doing in the General Assembly right now with this decision. So, you know, the, the, the shoe is very comfortable when it's on the other foot, but this dynamic of politics, we elect judges, we elect justices to the North Carolina State Supreme Court. How do we not envision politics playing into this game? And then I was just going to piggyback, Michael, on what you said, you know, it was the Republican legislature that made the races for the Supreme Court partisan in 2018. So exactly. uh, that was their choice. Now, you know, this, you know, it's like, I want to say it's halftime. I'm not even sure. It's like, because the game never ends, right? I mean, this just could, goes on and on and on. <laughs> but we're setting up for a huge moment because two justices, there will be two seats open. Uh, Judge Irvin is up for re-election, and then uh, Justice Hudson is not running. So we've got two Democratic seats up for re-election. Republicans are saying 2022 will be a good year for us, most likely. We are going to win those two seats. We will take the majority, and then it'll be our court again. We'll draw new maps, and I mean, you know, this is all implied, and then the Supreme Court will uphold them. So it just, it, it never stops it is so steve it hasn't it? stopped since 1980 yeah. so you know <laughs> this this is the norm in north carolina is there a better way to do this michael i mean clearly is there must be a better way is there a better way has anybody found <laughs> it is anybody doing it i mean some would argue that uh, a state like iowa through its redistricting process which basically assigns to politically neutral, unaffiliated uh, staffers who then bring the maps, you know, based on a narrow set of criteria to the legislature for an up or down vote is the way to go. We've seen some states try independent commissions. Virginia tried it and it's basically fallen apart. So we're dealing with human beings. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, what this ruling means and the timeline and who actually might end up drawing these maps if the legislature does not do a good job in the mind of the court. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. 
Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and First Citizens Bank. For over 120 years, First Citizens has been committed to helping families and businesses handle the financial ups and downs life brings. More at firstcitizens.com. Forever First, member FDIC. While the Winter Olympics kicked off in Beijing on Friday, nearly 3,000 athletes traveled from around the globe to represent their nations. But it's not all fun and games. More than 200 human rights groups are boycotting the Olympics big silver China's exploitation of its Uyghur population. In addition, the U.S., U.K., Canada, and several European nations did not send their diplomatic delegations. Of course, a Uyghur helped light the Olympic flame. Uh, over the weekend, so we'll be sure that we'll be talking about that in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock on 1A. And we will continue our conversation about the Supreme Court in the state voting down our new maps in a second. Stay with us. Black History Month Profiles, presented by listener-funded public radio 90.7 WFAE. Private First Class James Anderson Jr. enlisted in the Marines and was sent to Vietnam in 1966. In an act of selfless bravery, Anderson wrapped his body around a live grenade, which saved the lives of other Marines. On August 21, 1968, Anderson was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for Heroism, the first Black American Marine to receive such an honor. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. Steve Harrison is with us. He's our political reporter at WFAE News. Dr. Michael Bitzer is chair of the political science department. Politics and history is what he teaches at uh, uh, Catawba College. And Seema Ayers, our chief, the chief legal correspondent for WJZY Fox 46, Queen City News. It's a long title. We're talking about the rejection. Of, <laughs> you can drop of, the Fox 46. Now. You. <laughs> You're officially allowed, Mike Collins. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we're talking about the, the Supreme Court decision on Friday afternoon, striking down the latest edition of voting maps by the designed by the state legislature. Steve, the high court gave the legislature until February the 18th. That's 11 days from now to submit new maps that reflect the full intent of this decision that they handed down. And then the court has until I feel I think February 23rd, 24th, to decide whether lawmakers have appropriately responded. If not, if they decide that they have not appropriately responded, what happens? So, right. And, and what's also interesting is that the court invited the plaintiffs to also submit their maps. Now, the League of Conservation Voters, one of the plaintiffs already put forth their so-called proposed maps that they think should be enacted. So uh, the League will submit those, the other plaintiffs can submit maps. So we'll have this, uh, this pool of, in theory, new maps from the legislature, that, and also mixed with maps from the plaintiffs. Um, in theory, any one of those can be picked. One interesting thing is the legislature has been given a second chance to draw maps. They also have to show their work. They have to submit an analysis that shows um, that the maps are fair and to show how they came to that. Uh, it's, it's kind of vague, but to essentially say, hey, this is the analysis we did to show that these are balanced and not uh, punitive against Democrats. Yeah, this is very much like a math quiz in high school. Show your work. Uh, don't just give me the answer. Uh, and and if, uh, if, de if Democrats were allowed to draw these maps, if they submit, if the plaintiffs submit their maps and the court says, OK, we'll go with those. How, how different will things be, Steve? Well, one I mean, one I do think one thing that is interesting in the ruling is that while the, the legislature has to, like we said, show their work, um, there isn't a requirement. I don't think on the, among the plaintiffs when they submit their maps. And so this was a bit of a controversy because in the going back to the trial court, the League of Conservation Voters had uh, proposed their maps, but you know there wasn't much, much uh, transparency on how those were created and in what form and who did them. So um, you know, the, the plaintiffs, I assume, their congressional map will be along the lines of seven, seven, seven Democratic seats, seven Republican seats, or maybe eight Republican seats and six Democratic. I would assume that the legislature will come back with a nine, five with more competitive seats, and then that'll be the big, the big fight, right? Uh, I don't think the legislature is going to draw a map that gives the Democrats uh, six or seven seats. I, I would be surprised by that. Well, Seema, at one point, it was rumored that the legislature might impeach 
the Supreme Court justices if they ended up drawing the new maps themselves after the legislature submits their own. Uh, can they do that? And what would the political fallout of that be? Oh, gosh. Okay. Recusal, now impeachment. Uh, I think impeachment is even a higher standard. Uh, and I just don't see that there's any grounds for it at this point, because there would have to be some type of uh, at least show at least some demonstration of wrongdoing, not just impropriety, number one. Number two is we haven't gotten the full dissent yet. So we haven't gotten the full opinion, nor have we gotten the full dissent. But in the dissent, I feel like Chief Justice Newby does in a way cover himself because he makes, I mean, number one, he says, okay, my colleagues have a political agenda and that's why they've come to that conclusion. But he also does point out to, there's no standard for this. Uh, we've made a constitutional commitment and we can't make a, a determination when we, there is no legal criteria but he also makes a, i thought was a really good point especially when it comes to now the led uh, the general assembly having to show their work is that he's saying there's no uh determination by the majority of what acceptable data is. So you can show your work and give the data but what is actually the standard now? So the, according to Martin on Twitter, and he points out the obvious here, that the, the order came out on Friday with the ruling giving more reasoning it, it to follow. As you said, we haven't seen it yet. How unusual, Seema, is that for, for it to come out that way? And does it make it harder for the General Assembly to comply with the intent of the ruling? I think it actually happens more often than you think. It's not common, probably, you know, on in higher courts, federal courts, and especially in the Supreme Court, you know, you'll get like these emergency rulings, especially during like the COVID and pandemic and with vaccines and mask mandates. However, uh, in this particular circumstance, that emergency ruling makes perfect sense given this timeline of the primaries. The decision, Michael, by the United States Supreme Court to let state courts decide on the legality of uh, political gerrymandering in accordance with their individual state constitutions has resulted in GOP drawn maps being overturned in Pennsylvania, as you mentioned, in 2018, and in Ohio and in Alabama last month. Were these all Democrat controlled courts or were these bipartisan or unpartisan decisions rendered after a clear eyed examination of the maps through the lens of the law? My recollection is that the Ohio decision was a Republican-led uh, led court uh, in Alabama. I am not sure, but I would have to suspect that it was also a Republican uh, court simply because of the dynamics in, in Alabama. They are a highly Republican state. Uh, you know, when it comes to the judiciaries in the states, we have to remember, we oftentimes think there's just one legal system, there's just one judiciary. That's the national dynamic. Every state has its own judicial system, its own processes, its own constitution. And so states have the flexibility. They are laboratories of democracy and courts can intervene in these types of political and policy questions at the state level and be determinative as is the case in the, with the particularly the state legislative districts. The congressional districts may be another factor moving forward. The whole way the appeals process works, Seema, is that one court will overrule a previous decision of another court, and that's what's happened here. The lower court, which is Republican-controlled, said, no, the maps can stand. The plaintiffs appealed. The higher court, the Supreme Court, Democratic-controlled, said, no, the maps can't stand, and they are the final word because they're the Supreme Court. But how can two courts use the same Constitution and the same maps and come to a completely diametrically opposed decision? Different judges different judges, different So what does that say about the law? the law? What does that say uh, about the specificity? The law is gray. The law is gray. Uh, I think it really depends on the interpretation. And again, I think with this Supreme Court, they found a way to have the Constitution and that upholding the Constitution for the individual citizens trumps the General Assembly's power 
for uh, creating districts. And that is, 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 is well settled law, number one. Number two is they relied on this 2018 case. Now, I just want to talk about appeal. Do you want me to tell you about? Okay, so here's the, so there's actually, um, so an emergency uh, application for a stay pending appeal, they gave them a date of February 23rd. Now, yes, the, the North Carolina Supreme Court has the final word. However, I would love to see the defendants pose a federal question and then take this case to the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, Michael. Tell me. That, and, and in <laughs> fact, the Republican legislature defendants inserted in their brief to the state Supreme Court a question about Article One, Section 4 in the U.S. Constitution. That will only apply to the congressional map, but it does raise a federal question that they hinted very strongly, if you strike down the congressional maps, we will appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court on those maps and have a determinative uh, decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. But won't the Supreme Court simply kick it back down because they've already said we're not going to decide on partisan gerrymanders. That's going to be the purview of the state courts and the state constitutions. What the, what the legislators would appeal on is the time, place, and manner provision, which is very different from what they dealt with in the Rucho v. Common Cause case. And that says state legislators will be the ones responsible for time, place, and manner. And that includes drawing district lines. So they're not appealing about. on partisan gerrymandering. That's the bottom no. line. They're, yes, yeah, they're going to appeal on a different Correct. issue. So, Steve, let's talk about some of the uh, state Supreme Court's uh, wording in, in this ruling. They cited multiple reliable ways of deciding when a gerrymandered map has crossed the line into unacceptable parts, partisanship, but they did not satisfy legislators' demands for a bright line to show them when that line had been crossed. So is this going to be kind of like, uh, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see when it? When I see it. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think that's a pretty good example. Um, yeah, you said it perfectly, that the Republicans are saying like, and, and this was a common theme throughout the the uh, original trial and the oral arguments before the court last week, was that you know, you have to, this is their argument, you have to set some kind of standard, tell us what is okay and what isn't, where is the line? Um, you know, I think that they will probably point to, um, they will, I believe, are going to point to one of the analysis done by one of the expert witnesses for the plaintiffs, a University of Michigan mathematician who, you know, in his computer simulations of a congressional map, found that the most common map favored Republicans in nine seats and Democrats in five. And now to be sure within that simulation, there were a lot more competitive seats, right? So it was, it could, you know, either there were a lot more seats at play, which isn't the case now. So I think they'll probably, they may kind of use, uh, try and find that analysis is their safe harbor to say, look, seven, seven, a completely split map is not particularly likely when a computer draws this, but uh, yeah, the, the, right. That, that was their big argument the whole time. Tell us what the so, line is. Asima, in its decision, the state Supreme Court wrote, quote, the General Assembly must not diminish or dilute any individual's vote on the basis of party affiliation. The fundamental right to vote includes the right to enjoy substantially equal voting power and substantially equal legislative representation. So if this decision stands, does this set precedent? Will it end political gerrymandering? Oh, this is a total game changer. Every single thing in North Carolina has changed forever. Plus, other states are going to look to this decision just like we looked to the 2018 Pennsylvania decision. So if... Wait, well, why is Michael laughing at me? Oh. Well, uh, the only <laughs> thing that I would say, let's put a little asterisk by your previous statement, okay. is that if the Republicans take over the Supreme Court, they have, there, there have been various operatives that have been very clear in saying, 
you will rue the day this decision came down because we will have a new case presented and the Republican majority will reverse this precedent. And this is where the political fight is becoming brass knuckles. So how will this change the landscape, Steve, of the next election, given what the, the, if, this, if the decision stands, what is likely to be the situation congressionally and legislatively in terms of how these maps are drawn and who might run and, and who might be disadvantaged and what incumbents will be hurt, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of Democrats who are up in the air who are kind of waiting to see. I mean, you have Erica Smith, who was running for Congress, who dropped out of the race to run for G.K. Butterfield's seat in the Northeast. That's the seat that still leans slightly Democratic, but the legislature took a lot of African-American voters out of that district. She's running, but, you know, I think if you had to say right now in this environment, she would probably be the underdog in that race, right? So she's hoping that her seat gets a little more Democratic. You've got Kathy Manning, the Democratic Congresswoman from Greensboro. Her seat was just wiped off the map. It's gone. Uh, she's waiting to see, does her seat come back? Um, there are, you've got, you know, the Madison Cawthorn situation. Does his seat that he moved into, you know, this one in Gaston, Cleveland, and Mecklenburg County, what do they do with that? I mean, there's so many things up in the air right now. Uh, some people are going to be running regardless, but there's a lot of big decisions coming based on what these new maps look like. And if this court ruling stands, Michael, uh, and the maps are redrawn to the court's satisfaction, how might the result impact the legislators, the Republican supermajority in the legislature? And what would that portend? I think it's likely that if we see a less partisan map come out of this process, that the supermajorities that were very conceivable, that were very evident within these maps would likely go away. I still would think that Republicans would likely have the advantage in both the state house and state Senate, just simply because of the political geography of this state and the dynamics that you are constrained with when you are seeking to read draw these districts based on the neutral criteria. So I think advantage would still be to the Republicans, but they wouldn't have the ability to override a Democratic v uh, governor's veto. So I guess we'll all gather 11 days from now when the maps have been submitted and we know what the picture is, uh, is going to be and whether or not these, uh, the court will accept them. Uh, last word comes from Dr. Michael Bitzer, the chair of the political science department at Catawba College, Seema Iris, chief legal correspondent at WJZY 46 Queen City News, and Steve Harrison as our political reporter here at WFAE. Thank you all for the hour. Charlotte Talks with Mike Collins is a production of 90.7 WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from Mazda of South Charlotte. Our executive producer is Wendy Herkey. The senior producer is Erin Kiever. Our producers are Gabe Altieri and Jesse Steinmetz. Our engineer is Joby Sprinkle. For more information about Charlotte Talks, go to wfae.org slash charlotte talks. It's your world. We help you explore it. It's a civil war that has gone on for years on the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen. It's your community. We help you understand it. The hurdles CMS has encountered in building a Latino principal pipeline illustrate bigger statewide issues. Governor Roy Cooper has urged the state to rally to get more educators of color into public schools. WFAE's Morning Edition is an essential way to start your day and stay connected to your world. Weekday mornings from 5 to 9 on 90.7 WFAE. If you were following along in the script provided for the home version of this program, you know that today we were going to talk about what happens if COVID becomes an endemic. We'll do that on Thursday. And tomorrow, we'll talk about the latest report on homelessness in Charlotte, uh, what it found, and the, the, the solutions that it is suggesting that we undertake to get a handle on it. 
support for which will come from WFAE members and Charlotte Counseling Associates, helping families, couples, and individuals address infidelity, sexually problematic behavior, and men's assertiveness in relationships online or in person at charlottecounselors.com. Rain until early afternoon with a high near 40, more chance of rain tonight around 30, cloudy, sunny as over over time tomorrow with a high near 50 it's 33 right now at wfae charlotte wfhe hickory 106.1 larenburg 93.7 southern pines we're live we're local with charlotte's npr news source we're three days into the beijing olympics and already there's lots to see on the snow and ice but are these winter games a little too frosty from wamu and npr in washington this is 1a 